during this Lenten season, we've been making our way, discussing the gospel of Jesus Christ, not in its end result only, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, but in the life of Christ. Throughout his life, we see good news being given to us as he teaches us new things, new ways to approach God and to think about God. Now, it's very easy for us in our time to kind of take for granted some of the things that Jesus taught. But let's be clear. While Jesus was here on earth ministering, he was a revolutionary. He was saying things that were not said before him. He was going against the grain. He was reteaching people an idea of who God is and how to approach him. Because they had been so mired in a religious system that they had received from Moses in the Old Testament. Now, let's be clear, I'm in no way disparaging that system. That system was supposed to show us how difficult it is to get to God. And it is difficult, and it does cost a lot. But the wonderful thing about Jesus is he came to fulfill everything that that system needed, and he came to instead replace that system with one that we can actually accept for ourselves, one that can actually work for the average person. And that is a wonderful thing. We are going to look at prayer today. And we're going to look at prayer as it was and what Jesus made it. And we're going to see how through the blood of Jesus Christ, we have access to God in a way that we never did. Think to yourself before we go into this. What would it have been like for you to approach God in the Old Testament? First and foremost, you would have to go buy something. You'd have to buy a lamb or a goat. You would have to buy something, a bull or some doves. And then you would have to take that gift all the way to Jerusalem, to the temple. And instead of you being able to talk directly to God yourself, guess what you'd have to do? You'd have to take that stuff and give it to somebody called a priest. And the priest would have to be the one to go before God on your behalf. So even though you're doing all of this, God was never actually attainable to you. God was never actually someone that you could know for yourself. Because there were people designated to speak to him, not you. Do you remember the, the sound of the people as they stood under Mount Sinai when Moses was receiving the tablets and lightning and thunder was streaking across the sky and there was an earthquake and what did the people say to Moses? The people said, Moses, Moses, you speak to us, Moses, but don't let God speak to us lest we die. You see, there was fear in the hearts of people before God because they knew something that I think we have forgotten. They knew that God is holy and all-powerful and that we are not. And the, even the idea of approaching God was a fearful thought to them. You know why? Because unholy things can't approach holy things. And they understood that. They knew that no matter how many sacrifices they bring to the temple, you still can't come to God yourself. And that, my friends, is what Jesus changed. Jesus, as the Word of God says, he tore the veil of the temple in two, opening up a way between us and God. So that now you don't need a priest. No, you don't need someone speaking for you. You can go to God yourself. And you don't have to go to God fearing and trembling because of your sinfulness. You can go to God as he invites you to come boldly. Why? Because of what Jesus Christ has done in order that you can approach God boldly, without fear knowing that he loves you and knowing that he invites you to come 
It is one of the most wonderful realities of Christianity to know that you have direct access to someone that you could never access in and of yourself. He is your maker, yes, but he is the holy one, the righteous one, where no sin can glory in his presence. But through the blood of Jesus Christ, we have access to God. And that, my friends, is good news. Father, this morning, as we look very briefly at this, show us from God's word what you've done for us in prayer. In Jesus' name, amen. The Bible says in Hebrews chapter 1, verse 1, God, who at various times and in various ways spoke in times past to the fathers by the prophets, has in these last days spoken to us by his Son, whom he has appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the worlds. God has been communicating to us from the very beginning. God gave us Moses, who wrote most of the Old Testament, who gave us Moses and gave us a law through Moses so that we might know the high standard of God's holiness. If you go back into the Old Testament and you see all of the things that were commanded for people to do, know this one thing, it's very hard for unholy people to approach a holy God. It's hard. And the law represents that. The reason why you had to come to God with a particular kind of offering on a particular day, in a particular way, offered in a certain kind of way, it was to show us one thing. You can't come to God the way you want to. You can only come to a holy God the way he opens for you. And that was the way. The way was, hey, you have to come through difficulty, through challenge, knowing this one thing. That unholy man and holy God cannot commune. The communion of God with man only comes on God's terms, not on man's terms. That's what the law was for. But we thank God. Jesus Christ came as the fulfillment of the law. He is the only one who has lived a sinless life fulfilling all of the commandments of Moses doing exactly what God demanded, and that is why he is, he is qualified to be our representative to God. Why? Because he did something that you and I could never do. He lived a sinless life, but not just that. He is Almighty God in flesh, so he is able to touch God, because he is God. And so he touches God, and he touches us, and through his blood, he brings us together. You see, that's the reason why you can't have grace of God and law at the same time. You have to make a choice. Either you're going to come to God through the ways that he has commanded you to behave, or you're going to come to God through his substitutionary atonement that he has made for you. And by the way, none of us can come this way because we've already proven that we're not holy enough to come this way. So if we can't come the way of living a perfect life, then we must come the way of atonement, meaning we have to accept a gift that was given to us so that we might actually have a relationship with God. It may seem technical, but it is so important to understand why. Because if you don't understand it, how in the world are you going to understand how to treasure it, how to treat it, and how to live? You see, religion is developed because for many of us, religion is our way of doing things so that we might be right with God. But we've already proven through the Old Testament that religion will never make you fully right with God. Because guess what? The same worship you give today, you're going to have to go back and give it tomorrow and the day after that and the day after that. Why? Because we keep on messing up, don't we? <laughs> we keep on messing up. So we keep on needing the cleansing and forgiveness of God. But it never makes us fully right with God. 
The only thing that takes away our sin and makes us right with God is the substitutionary work of Jesus for us where he took upon himself all our sins so that if we trust and believe in him, we will be right before God through the justification that his blood gives us. It is not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to what? His mercy that he saves us. That, my friends, is what Christianity is based on. It is moving away from this system of rules and regulations and moving to an understanding that the only way you can be right before God is to receive a gift. Receive a gift that he has graciously offered you free of cost through the shed blood of his son. Does that make sense? <laughs> it is technical only to those who are not willing to realize you can't come to God your way. You have to come through the way that he has provided for you. God has spoken through his son now. And his son has been described in many places, and particularly in the book of Hebrews, as our great high priest. And there's a reason why he's referred to as our great high priest. Do you remember in the Old Testament, it was the priest who had to go between the person and God to offer the sacrifice. Wasn't that true? So Jesus Christ is described as our great high priest now because he is the one who goes between us and God and allows us to have relationship now. We don't go through a man, a flawed man or a flawed woman. We go through the perfect Lamb of God, Jesus Christ, who has proven that he is qualified for that job because he did not sin. Unlike all of us. The Bible says in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 14, Seeing then that we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession, for we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Do you see something different opening up to us through Jesus? It says here clearly that we can come now boldly to God's throne, the throne of grace. Why? Through Jesus Christ. The boldness is not because you're good enough or you're smart enough, or you know enough Bible verses, or you've been in church your whole life. That's not the reason why we're bold to come before God, because you can be all those things and still not be worthy because of our sinfulness. You come boldly to God through Jesus Christ because it is the shed blood of Jesus that cleanses us from all our sin, past, present, and future. So when I come before God, he doesn't see me for who I am. He sees me for what Jesus has made me. One who is clean, one who is pure, one who is worthy. So I don't have to wonder whether I'm going to come before God to be judged or a lightning bolt is going to strike me. No, I can come boldly because everything Jesus did for me invites me to come that way. Everything he's done for me has cleared up this problem between me and the Father. So I come because I am justified before the Father. Not because I'm perfect. I come because I'm forgiven and justified. Because I've accepted the gift he offered me. But this justification has opened up a door for us to God that we did not have before. In the Old Testament, we see people running away from the judgmental hand of God. Because God is always judging that which is sinful. His nature does not allow him to do anything but that. He is righteous through and through. But in Jesus Christ, now we don't have to run away anymore. We don't have to hide. We don't have to act. We can come as we are. Not perfect, but forgiven. And that is what the church of Jesus Christ is. It's just a bunch of forgiven people who are still not perfect, but at the same time have internalized the reality of their forgiveness through Jesus Christ. 
See, that reality is supposed to make us feel humble. That reality is supposed to make us have a sense of true treasure for the commitment that we've made to Christ. Where we honor Christ every day and we worship him and love him. You know the reason why most of us don't? It's because we don't understand what we have. <laughs> or many of us have never accepted it for ourselves. When you understand what God has done for you through Jesus Christ, there's only one response, you know, and that is humility and gratitude. You must be grateful because God did for us through Jesus something we could never have done for ourselves. So now we come to God in a different way. So what do we learn through prayer? In Matthew chapter 6, Jesus is once again teaching people something brand new, something they never knew before. And he's teaching them primarily about prayer. And he begins the portion in chapter 6 by talking about the way that people are. He says in verse 1, Beware practicing your righteousness before other people in order to be seen by them. For then you will have no reward from your Father who is in heaven. Thus, when you give to the needy, sound no trumpet before you as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, that you may be praised by others. Truly I say to you, they have their reward. But when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your giving may be in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you openly. Now this whole idea is revolutionary. He's saying to people, I don't need you anymore. God doesn't need you to show everybody how righteous you are. You don't need to go out there beating your chest and saying, oh, I give to the needy, or I've helped this person, or I've done that thing or that thing. Why? Because God is not impressed with that. God is not impressed with the actions we do. God is impressed with the choice we make in our hearts concerning him. That's the good news of the gospel. You don't have to do anything to get to God. You get to God only by choosing his way for you. And once you do that, God doesn't need you to do anything else. He could never get, you don't have to give to the poor to prove your righteousness. You don't have to show everybody out there how great you are. No. It's all about him now, a personal relationship with him. And that, my friends, is what applies directly to prayer. And he continues by saying these things in the, in the following verses. He says, and when you pray, you must not be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and at the street corners that they may be seen by others. Truly, I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you pray, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your father who's in secret. And your father who sees in secret will reward you openly. Another revolutionary thought. And the two thoughts and two points he's making in this portion is this. Number one, in prayer, you don't have to impress people anymore. It's not about people. It's about a personal relationship with God now. You see, in the Old Testament, prophets and priests would offer up prayers on behalf of the people. But no individual person could think that they could just approach God like that. Because God is so other. God is so unlike us. How can I speak to God? Well, Jesus is showing how. Jesus is saying, before it used to be about what people think about you. The way that you display your righteousness in public settings. But now, it is not about that. Your relationship with God is not about what you do publicly. It is about your personal relationship with him behind closed doors. Why? Because God is interested in a personal relationship. Unfortunately, sometimes religion is about the public display. It's about who's here, who's singing, who's doing things, who's contributing things, 
Who's helping this person? Who's doing that thing? And many of us, we base our relationship with God on the things that we can publicly say we've done for God. But let me say this, my friend. You can impress any amount of people with the things that you've done. It does not equate to a personal relationship with God. Because God understands who we are. And God is not all about other people giving you accolades. At this point, it is about understanding that the only real accolades we need must come from God himself. Not from people. As a pastor, I can tell you, sometimes I will say things that people do not like. I mean, we always want to know that people like us or like the things that we teach or say. I've come across many people who hate some of the things I teach. But that's okay. As far as I'm concerned, it is really about being a, a good and fair person when it comes to telling what the Word of God actually teaches. It may challenge me sometimes, but that's my job. It may be hard for me sometimes to swallow, but that's what being a good prophet is all about. It's about saying what God said, not adding to it, not subtracting from it. So, in reality, if I listen to what people's opinion of what I say, if I listen to that above what it is that God is telling me to do, then I've already received my reward. I'm liked or I'm not liked. That's my reward. But if I am in this, because I want the gospel of Jesus Christ to go forth. That I want those who treasure and value it to be able to accept it for themselves and to grow in it. Then the reward, my friend, is not about people liking me or not liking me. <laughs> the reward is the, the approval of God himself. And that's fair for me. I'm good with that. I choose that any day above a pat on the back. Because God's thoughts about me matter a lot more than yours. <laughs> a lot more. Because guess what? God can condemn me to hell. You can't. <laughs> God can do more in terms of my hurt than you can. Eternally. And so who should I treasure more? Man's opinion or his? It's not even close. It must be about God. So I don't do this to impress people. I don't pray to impress people, and neither should you. Prayer is now about, I get to talk to God myself. I don't need to go through a priest. I don't need to go with any animal or anything. I can literally shut myself in my room by myself and speak to the Almighty, who was, who was at one time afar off from me. <laughs> that reality should ring bells in the mind of a person who does not know this. And it probably was for everyone listening to this sermon. You mean I can actually talk to God? You mean he's not angry with me? He's not trying to kill me? Yes! Because through the shed blood of Jesus Christ, we have that access. What a wonderful reality. What good news! That we can talk to God now. Sin and all, we can talk to God. It's an amazing thing. But not just that. It's not about impressing people because it's personal. It's also not about impressing God. <laughs> you know what it means to impress God? You know, many of us, we talk to God as though God doesn't know who we are. We use all the flowery language and, and stuff that, you know, churchy, churchy language. We know what it is. We know the language because we think in some ways, if we don't use the churchy language, then God is not impressed and that God will reject us. But one of the wonderful things about this new reality of prayer is it's not even about impressing God. You know why you can't impress God? Do you know why you can't? You can't impress God because God, unlike everybody else, God knows everything. <laughs> you can only impress people 
who don't know everything. <laughs> oh, you, Pastor Andrew, you came up with that idea? What, what a different angle. Wow, that's impressive. You think when I say these things concerning God, that God already knows that he's looking down at me like, Andrew, I'm impressed with you? No. He's looking deeper. He's looking deeper than what I say. He's looking at the real me. He's looking at me. All of the things that right now I am conflicted with, he sees all those things right now and loves me right now and is patient with me right now. When I ask him for something in prayer, do you think I'm informing him? No. When I tell God what it is that I need in prayer, all I am doing is showing him that I am entrusting him with my life and entrusting him with things, even though he knows it, I still feel like I wanna commune with him. That's why I talk to him. I've heard people say, well, God knows it all. Why do we need to pray? Well, we talk to God because we have a relationship with God, not because we just want things from God. <laughs> we talk to God because we want to know him and we want him to know us, <laughs> even though he already knows us. That's how you relate to someone in personal relationship. Stop using the excuse of God's knowledge to keep us from having a true and honest and real relationship with God. I tell God every day, I'm like, God, you see my heart. You know my conflicts. You know the issues that I'm dealing with. You know the struggles that I have with your word. You know the struggles I have with myself. You know all my good. You know all my bad. You've accepted me for who I am. Lord God, please be patient with me. <laughs> Lord God, please help me. Lord God, please show me things I've never seen before. And I pray one of these days that I will be better than I am today. <laughs> I pray. And guess what? To me, those are the best kind of prayers. Why? Because they're real. We don't need to impress God. He knows the truth. He knows the truth. He knows what's real. You can't pull the wool over the eyes of someone who knows everything, who made everything. So I don't pray to impress God. I pray to be real with God. I pray to be true to God in my frailty, in my sin. I pray because I need God. That's what it's for. So now instead of running away from God, I can run to God with all of my, all of my foolishness, all of my confusion, all of my cares, all my concerns, and I can live. I can live. So, I don't need to impress anyone now through prayer, and I also don't need to impress God through prayer. Now, I can have a personal relationship with God, and I can also, by God's will, be as real as possible with God. Can you imagine if it wasn't just being real with God, but if we could be real with each other? A lot of the judgment that goes on in church would disappear because we would quickly realize we're all struggling with the same things. <laughs> We all are in the same issues, have, dealing with the same issues, the same problems of sin. And instead of judging each other for it, maybe we could take a little bit of time to commiserate, but also to seek God together and find ways in which to build each other up and be stronger. That's what a church should be, a hospital for the sick, not a courtroom to judge and to sentence people to jail. That's what God has called us to. The gospel of prayer is evident. We have access to God now. We don't have to do anything but come to him as we are. And we don't have to impress anybody. We don't even have to impress him. We can speak to him as a father, as a son to a father, as a daughter to a father. We can tell him things he already knows, but yet still we tell him those things because we want him to understand that we treasure our relationship with him. That's why we speak to him. That's why we love him. That's why we reach out to him. Amen. Father in heaven, thank you so much for this word. I pray that you will help us by your power to understand prayer, 
and to live in the new reality that Jesus has given us. It's not about impressing anybody. It's about being true to you, being real with you. Struggling, yes, but being real with you because that's the access you've given us now through the shed blood of Jesus Christ. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.